especiales. Eh, We're going to si wait a, a couple more minutes, allow people to connect. And then we will introduce our guests of honor. Mark, you look comfy. Es bien cómodo. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Dan. Hello. Good to see Hello you. Hello there. Ruben. I forgot I was Hello, muted. Jody. Yes. Thanks for joining, Mark. Jennifer. Hi there. Paula. And Jamie. Oh, nice to see you. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to see you. Laura, ready to practice your Spanish? <laughs> sí. Okay, no. <laughs> you could Natalia estás en mute. Sí. Ya, ya lo quité. <laughs> Lindsay, hola, ¿cómo estás? Tengo una pregunta, acá se conecta todo el mundo o esta es la sala de los principales y hay gente conectada? No, esto es, 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 es un foro relativamente íntimo, entonces mm -hmm. eh, lo, que, lo que siempre hemos querido es tener la, el espacio abierto para que al final sea un diálogo entre, entre, entre todos, ¿no? Okay. Kathleen, Saira. So one more minute before we begin, and then we're going to ask everybody to mute. At the end, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Bueno, ¿por qué no empezamos? Uh, Why don't we begin? Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone. Here I am, the, the chair of the uh, Latin American Caribbean Working Group and working as interpreter, simultaneous interpreter today. Today, what can we say? Just uh, 10 days ago, we had our permanent council meeting with the G4 and uh, WHO meeting in Geneva. And we know that there are tremendous challenges in front of us. So much need to help those who, who need us. And it's a privilege to have this conversation today for this group. We are very interested to hear uh, a very intimate discussion of the challenges uh, faced by our patients, the realities, and the challenges confronted by our medical colleagues. I want to say thank you to Physicians for Peace, Jamie, Vivi, Kathleen, for the work that you do. And, and all, all of you from Physicians for Peace for the work you do in so many countries. And today in particular, we have the opportunity to have two very special guests. I'm gonna uh, hand off the word to uh, Viviana to do the introductions. Thank you, Ruben. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Viviana Gama. I am one of the program directors of Physicians for Peace. Today, I want to thank all of you who have connected. In Physicians for Peace, our primary objective is to train and provide education 
for health professionals who work in low-income communities. Que a través de Through training and education, we are able to open, increase access to health services that is available to everyone. One of our programs in Physicians for Peace is the Burn Program. One of the countries where we work is Colombia. One of the first places we went in Colombia was this public hospital, uh, Hospital Bolivar, has the largest burn care facility in Colombia. There's a very difficult situation there that is acid attacks and the burns that are caused by these chemical agents. We had uh, the opportunity to meet Dr. Gaviria. In one of our first visits, we had a, the very, at a sad occasion to meet uh, a patient, Natalia Ponce. When we visited this burn unit to provide training, to, to generate this whole system of sharing knowledge, we found at that moment, uh, Natalia was in the ICU suffering serious burns that she, because of an acid attack that she had suffered the week prior. So I would like to present to you, we have Dr. Jorge Gaviria, plastic surgeon and reconstructive surgeon specialist from the Javeriana Pontifice University, more than 26 years experience in burn care, plastic surgery at, at the Simon Bolivar Hospital in Bogota, Colombia. Currently chief of plastic surgery of this hospital, coordinator of plastic surgery and, and reconstructive surgery and aesthetic surgery of the Sinu University in Bogota. Also professor of University of Ariana and a member of the Colombian Society of Plastic Surgery and the Ibero-American Plastic Surgery Society. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Viviana, for this invitation. For me, it's an honor to share with you some of my experience that we have had related to acid attack burns. It's a, a, a horrible situation that occurs in our country. First of all, I, I'm going to actually also introduce uh, Natalie. And Natalia Ponce de Leon is an audiovisual film professional. As she says, she was reborn from the ashes after the horrible attack, uh, acid attack that she was a victim a victim in March, 2014. She's currently president of the Natalia Ponce de Leon Foundation, which is a, a, a nonprofit foundation to protect human rights and promote human rights of the victims of burn attacks. And she uh, authored and promoted the law that is named after her in Bolivia. She has won many, many awards over the years uh, she has been an untiring promoter of the human rights of the victims of acid attacks. So we're going to start with Dr. Gaviria. Thank you, Natalia, also for accepting our invitation to be here. Go ahead, Dr. Gaviria. Thank you very much. As I said, thank you so much for allowing me to share with you my experience which is in a very difficult area. Uh, Colombia is one of the main countries that has this type of problem of acid attacks, which is just very unfortunate. These attacks, it's, it's, it's fairly common to suffer chemical burns because it is just too easy to get these chemicals. You can find them. Um, they're used to open the clogged drains or they can come out of car batteries, or there may be chemicals that cause burns from uh, work accidents or from wars. For example, this 
sir, this gen, this person who had a, a mustard gas burn is one example. But in Colombia, it is this is being used as a weapon to to solve domestic violence issues or personal conflicts uh, as a way of attacking people. It's happening. This is something that's happening throughout the planet, but it's very common in Asian countries, in the UK um, and in the UK. It has happened some in the United States, uh, sometimes in relation to, to drugs. But now the UK is actually the highest number of cases. They often use acid to mark the enemies of gangs. They mark them with acids. So that is the most common motive. Uh, other countries, it's used differently, this form of attack. In 2011, comparing with Pakistan and Bangladesh, which are other countries that have fairly common cases of acid attacks of, against women. Colombia, uh, compared to our female population, was an even higher level of percentage of per capita attacks. The causes of this, they're same all over the world. They're money conflicts, uh, theft, domestic conflicts, uh, intermarriage conference, family uh, violence. The most frequently used chemical agents are sulfuric acid, nitric acid, fluorohydric acid, or sodium hydroxide, um, which is, is used for cleaning pipes, unclogging pipes. Colombia has always had a problem in terms of databases. In, in medical legal terms, in, we found that uh, between 2008, 2013, 719 cases of chemical attacks. They occurred both among women and men. And we've seen it in all age groups. Uh, it happens throughout the national territory, uh, but especially in Medellin and Bogota. The face or face and other areas of the body are the most frequent uh, body parts affected. Quite often, the victims don't even know their attacker, but, but many times it's often uh, uh, their ex-companion um, um, or, or husband or wife, but often it is, uh, there, there usually is some connection with the attacker. Sometimes they don't realize it until later. Uh, over pa the past many years, we have found that chemical attacks between 2008 and 2013, it was an average of 130 cases a year. Once the law was passed, the Natalia Ponce de Leon law, the rate has come down. And now the cases, the case numbers have gone down to around 40 cases a year. This was uh, published in a Latin American newspaper. We have had 126 cases that have been documented. And this year, there have, all, there have been three so far, all women. You can also, interesting to see, before the year 2011, the only victims were women. It was a gender issue. Between 2011 and 2014, you saw also attacks um, among men. 2014 was the highest number of attacks, and that was the year that Natalia Ponce suffered her aggression. And that was when we were seeing the most uh, cases. Um, 
later we see there were years when it was most often male victims, uh, often associated with, with theft. And then later, again, it's now more prevalent among women. So here you can see again, women, the most common is uh, 20 to 30 years are the most common victims. Young women, often very beautiful young women, heads of family, the face and the neck are the most frequently injured areas because that is that is the intention of the aggressor. They want them to always remember this attack and so they damage their face. This is different from in Asian uh, countries where you see more often genital or other body parts affected. Often these attacks happen when somebody is coming home or leaving either their home or their work. This indicates that in general, the, the aggressor is studying the movements uh, to determine what is the best moment to attack the victim. The sulfuric acid is the most often used uh, they usually get it from uh, batteries, battery acid. So uh, several laws then were, were developed. Previously, this was just considered something involving gender violence. In, in 2013, the fines, the punishments were increased. And then after that, there were several uh, more decrees and resolutions to uh, increase the punishments. And it wasn't until 2016 when the Natalia Ponce de Leon law increased to 50 years of prison, the, the punishment uh, for injuring a, a, a minor woman uh, with permanent damages. And then we developed protocol. This law also established protocols about how to care for victims. We developed first a protocol of what, what should the first person providing first aid for these victims, what should they do? We developed a, a chart to share, always using biosecurity protection measures. The per first person who comes upon a victim should use uh, gloves and protect their eyes. They, they need to have uh, soap and water. You need certain elements of your kit. Uh, and you should put uh, the, the clothing and anything that's affected into bags. Once they call the emergency services, the police are generally the first ones to arrive. They are often the first ones to identify who the victim or victims are. There may be more than one. Sometimes if it's a, a mother with children, there may be several people affected. We identify who was the primary victim, what parts of the body are affected. And if we have water, the, the parts that we focus on first are this, the, the special areas, which are hands, feet, uh, the folds of the skin, genitals, and especially eyes. When the first aid person arrives, it's important to for everybody to try to stay calm, to tell the victim, I am here to help you. Don't promise anything. And do not judge or blame the victim or question or, or threaten them in any way. Don't make it worse for them. 
take off the, the clothing, cutting it. it. Don't try to take off the clothing the conventional way because it might spread the, the acid more. Uh, and the skin will uh, get inflamed. So take off any jewelry, there will be swelling. Then with paper towels, we try to clean off the skin. But not to soak the body because that will contaminate the and spread the, the acid through the rest of the body. If there is any acid in the eye, that area we do have to wash with water. Saline solution if you have it or a regular water and then wash with soap, liquid soap if you have it, that will improve the pH of the skin. And it's very important here in Colombia, we, it's, it, it's common that people put uh, different things like onion or butter or honey. We have a we have the custom in, in Colombia of putting different uh, things on a burn. Do not do any of that. If the chemical was uh, inhaled or ingested, if there are chemicals in a powder form, uh, be careful not to let those get wet. And also, it's don't cause vomit because that could uh, make it worse by affecting the esophagus. Try to always be very respectful of the person. And it's very important that, that the doctors are following all of these rules. Even if it's a third tier hospital, they need to follow these protocol. This was a patient, a, a woman who was attacked in the street. Uh, it used to be, it, it, in the previous times, people didn't help. Uh, if someone was attacked in the street, nobody else helped them because they didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to get involved in the legal. Uh, in this case, the, the woman uh, found a hose and washed out, washed off with uh, water. Um, and she was able to wash most of it off. This is another example of someone who had timely care. She spent three hours washing with water. And when she came to the hospital the next day, um, this was all that she had the damage from uh, uh, caustic. She arrived to the ER, when they arrived to the ER, we immediately have to, when they arrive to the ER, we have to report this to the authorities. It's uh, obligatory that we treat these patients. And they are number one priority patients. Of course, the first things are to check to make sure that their airway is clear, that they are, are able to breathe, check their circulation, etc. And I'll emphasize in no cases do, should we establish any barriers to emergency care. And we uh, held a course with many, many doctors participating. We, we have to involve a lot of different doctors and specialists in this care. Quite often we have to involve uh, ophthalmology. The, the acid, if it falls in the eyes, in the eyelids, we have to involve uh, ophthalmologic surgeons in their care. Also uh, pediatricians, if it is a child, general surgery, depending on the areas of the body that are affected. Uh, then we wash with a uh, saline solution for 30 minutes, and there's a, a full protocol of care. A lactate ringer, 
Then we cover the burns with compresses before 48 hours. The psychological aspect is actually the most important part of the care. As in any types of trauma, uh, in the third phase, when this person looks at him or herself in the mirror and doesn't recognize herself and feels that she or he has lost their identity, it creates a, com a terrible state of confusion, of, of uh, anguish, and it, it may lead to suicidal thoughts. This is a, a typical view of this type of lesion. You, there may be uh, affecting on the face and then it dripped off of the face and it affected another part of the body, in this case, the breast. The treatment is going to depend on the age of the patient, what chemical agent it was, how deep the burn is. Sometimes we see injuries such as this and the face, on the neck, hands, feet, uh, genitals. These are all the areas that we consider very urgent for primary care. There are often injuries in the eyelids and they will also have injuries in the eyes. The cornea, here you can see several examples of, of corneas that have been damaged. Um, between 25% affected and here we have one case where the, the eye was completely destroyed. The incomplete cornea, um, those patients almost always are left blind. Here we can see a cornea that was attacked with chemical and you can see the damaged area. You can see how it is very shiny, very transparent. That is the part that's damaged. And other examples, another patient with a porcelainized cornea you can see the, the damaged tissue. The important part in the eye is to wash, wash, wash for 40 minutes to an hour until the person says that it's not burning anymore. If we can put some drops in their eyes to anesthetize their eyes, we do that. The injuries in eyelids, which are very common, may require a uh, reconstructive surgery. It's about the most common reconstructive surgery. When the, the eyelids need to be reconstructed. Uh, otherwise, it, in other areas of the body, they can be addressed with uh, different treatments, such as in this case, it was a, a acetic acid case. We, we were able to uh, cure it. This was from some of the earliest patients. It, it isn't really documented in the literature. It was very difficult, very complicated to treat these patients. In this case, it was sulfuric acid. All of the left side of the face and part of the right side of the face, we tried to preserve the greatest part that we could of the skin tissue, but there was a high level of scarring. Fortunately for this woman, we were able to treat her skin um, and she was able to recover fairly well. This, this uh, lady was attacked by a 16 year old. Uh, they, somebody was, uh, someone else said, throw this bag of water on her, it's her birthday. And it ended up being not water in the bag, it was acid when we were we realized that the injury went all the way to the bone in her head. We had to go very quickly to surgery with her. As Bibiana said, this is when uh, Dr. Mohammed, other, other doctors arrived. 
and we were exchanging experiences with them. And we, we came to the conclusion that this patient had to go as soon as possible to the OR. As soon as we could stabilize the patient. And at this, on this visit, we were able to provide training to the entire rehabilitation team. Uh, she, this patient will be in rehabilitation for the rest of uh, her life. Here you can see our therapist who is doing one of the masks. And these are some of the Physicians for Peace trainers. So what happens with these patients? Most of these patients, most of them need surgery. What type of surgery? If they have blisters, we have to break the blisters because there's acid inside the blisters. This lady was burned by a neighbor because she hadn't paid her rent on time. And not only an acid attack, but she mixed it with hot water, which increased the reduced the concentration, but made very deep scars. We had to scrape off her lesions. This gentleman, he was a, a homeless person in the street. Often when they ask for money, uh, oh, he, a, a person, a street person asked his girlfriend for money. He said no, and he was uh, attacked with acid. We had to we had to scrape off the injured skin. This was a more superficial injury. Uh, here you can see this case that we saw earlier. Uh, after two weeks, it was a keloid, very very painful keloid that had formed. This woman was attacked by her ex-husband on a Christmas Eve. A sulfuric acid attack. It was very difficult for her to use a mask. But two weeks later, she had these very painful keloids uh, that are very de deformative. This was after, on the bottom, we're seeing after several surgeries. And with very intensive uh, therapies, you can see the final result. So ideal as in these cases, these patients were burned in public transportation. We had to take off all the burned and we put in skin grafts with their own skin. So those were the results that we were able to achieve. This woman, she was a recycler. Uh, she was drinking with her friends, alcohol. When the alcohol ran out, she didn't want to share more money uh, and somebody attacked her. That ochre colored attack. She went through a long treatment. We had to scrape off the burned. Uh, there were very deep burns. You can also see such serious burns as this. This is a very deep burn that affected the entire left part of the face. You can see the process of the surgery, treatments. Here you can see again the, the thick scars that happen. They're very difficult to manage. Uh, sorry, my my somebody's ringing my doorbell. Disculpe me. Bueno, entonces seguimos. Y esto es lo que pasa normalmente. This is what often happens. 
an abdomen, a, a, abdominal injury. You can see where we took off the burn, we covered with a tempor temporary coverings. There you can see more necrosis, more dead skin, all that acid that penetrated, it tries to, to come out and it produces more burns. And what usually happens, then we have to do surgery to try to take, to remove, to extract that surgery. Um, and then later we can do the skin grafts. Generally what we do is this, this process. We try to use uh, biological membranes. She had very profound burns on her face and thorax. We used uh, amniotic membrane patch. Uh, you can see it's almost like then on the bottom is three weeks post-op. And we were able to use some, some grafts from pigs. There's a certain type of paper. It's a it's an amniotic membrane tissue that we use to treat. This girl also had her, her entire breasts were burned, did the immediate reconstruction. This young man, uh, men are also victims of acid, sulfuric acid. We took him immediately to surgery, took all off the burned skin, put grafts, and here you can see a year and a half later. Here you can see his husband suspected that she was not faithful and through sulfuric acid causing these eyelid injuries. You can see the reconstructive surgery. And you can see that the nose, the mouth is all stretching. This is very complicated to treat many, many surgeries. It, it, often these victims happen to be very beautiful young women who are attacked in this way. The also burned and affected are the muscles that affect their movements. Most of the victims are gonna need many, many different procedures. This victim saw her attacker, put her face over her face, was able to protect some of her face, but it did affect the left side of her face. And these injuries get very easily get infected. Here you can see her after many surgeries and treatments, We've also had to operate her hand. She was also burned with a stove cleaner. Here you can see we were she was treated with amniotic membrane tissues. This victim was seriously burned. Uh, they said she was she was attacked because she was very beautiful. She had 17 surgeries to try to take off all the burned tissue. The cranium, the, her head was severely injured. Uh, many surgeries to close that injury. And you can see how the, the scars pull and stretch the face. This is the result after many, many surgeries, after about 12 surgeries to try to recover her face so that she can reincorporate within her social and family life and in work life. This is, the people who do these attacks say, if she's not for me, she's not for everyone. Men attack these beautiful women saying that, if I can't have her, nobody can. Here you can see the injury she suffered from the acid running down her neck and all the uh, uh, treatments she needed. She now always uses this scarf over the lower part of her face because of the injuries. 
here you can see another woman who was also attacked by her husband, uh, burned half of her nose that had to be reconstructed. Here, another beautiful young woman who was attacked. We had to take off all of her tissue. Again, we had to use dermal uh, grafts, uh, skin grafts. And you can see the keloid scars. And you can see this was about halfway through her treatment. This is a this is a recent case, December of last year. We're still uh, suffering these terrible attacks that are just unimaginable. So third degree burns, face and neck severely affected. Uh, this patient is going to need multiple surgeries and is going to have long term effects and is going to need a thousands of hours of rehabilitation and therapy because of all the very difficult scarring. This was a young woman, 20 years old. Somebody showed up in her home. This was a couple months ago through acid uh, affected in her mouth, her tongue. We had to take all of this affected skin and her part of her tongue, an enormous effect. And this is uh, how she is after the first reconstructive surgery. Very acceptable considering what she's been through. Uh, they're still gonna work on, um, as, the, as the scars form, she'll need more treatment. These cases continue to happen. It's very frustrating, our work fighting against this type of attack. These are some examples of uh, a woman who came from, uh, she was a, a guerrilla, she's part of the, um, the, in the war, she reincorporated within society. She wanted to not be involved anymore in the guerrilla and she was attacked with very serious effects. She lost all of her eyelids. The surgeries were not as effective in her case. This is what happens. The burn, it starts to, to pull off the skin. We do skin grafts. There's more infections. We have to do more skin grafts. The, the scarring becomes a fibrosis. It doesn't. In this case, it didn't let her open and close her eyes. We had to reconstruct her eyelids. But every injury becomes a keloid and we have to take it off scar by scar and try to remodel. Uh, we sometimes have to uh, graft in uh, fat and skin, surgery after surgery, until we have some recovery of the of the person's face. Even though the results are not perfect, this allows, for example, this woman to, she actually was able to remarry. She was able to have children. She is able to have a life again. And this is, uh, we're very proud of this as, as doctors to give her this. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the patient Natalia Ponce. And you can see from her injury, you can see 36 hours, there's a, a, a black brown scarring. You can see we took the skin off, there was bleeding, we put skin grafts. Every time we took off scarring, there was always another layer of necrotic tissue underneath. It, the, the effect keep go, kept going deeper to deeper, deeper tissues was affecting the muscles of her eyelids, of her nose, her mouth. Here you can see more and more layers of tissue that were affected. This, this skin bank that we would put on to facilitate her evolution. Uh, this is where we, 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 we tried to start doing the reconstruction with skin grafts. This skin, it, it sticks 
we have to do reconstruction at different different steps of reconstruction you can see how her eyelids are affected by the scarring you can see that the skin starts to see thick hard you could see that the nasal passages were closing you could see how the skin was getting more deformed as, as the skin is stretching. So we just kept reconstructing step by step. You can see how the skin was getting thick and hard. And it required hundreds of hours of treatment and care. It's really worth admiring when a, the patient continues with this process the the masks clear masks it's part of the part of the treatment different creams different silicone different massages many many hours until little by little the skin starts to improve you can see another part of the reconstruction of the the jaw Then it, it stretched out again. We had to do it again to do four surgeries to reconstruct the upper and lower lift. Uh, the eyelashes we had to reconstruct. We had to be treating all the scars as they formed. Again, here, the upper lip. Look, you can see here again, the lower lip needed to be reconstructed. And throughout all this process, she's doing her therapies. It's improving little by little. The skin quality is improving little by little. Then we started a laser treatment, which is like another burn. It's like a controlled burn to try to improve the skin texture and the internal texture of the skin. Then we have to reconstruct the nasal uh, passages. She's had many, many sessions of laser treatment. Then you can see that the skin is, the quality of the skin is improving until we're having a, a really good quality. Now you can see Today, Natalia is an icon uh, and support of women and against violence and as a promoter of the law against acid attacks. And she has headed many campaigns so that the entire community of Colombia, um, she is now known and she's also known at the international level and now she's going to share with us about her experience. Now I'll hand off to Natalia Ponce. Thank you, Dr. Gaviria. Good afternoon. Thank you for that interesting presentation, Dr. Gaviria. Thank you to Physicians for Peace for inviting me to be part of this afternoon to share my story with you, to show you that you can move forward, you can be reborn. My name is Natalia Ponce de Leon. I'm a survivor of an acid attack. On 27th of March, 2014, I was at, in my mother's home. It was 5.30 in the afternoon. I was in the door of my mother's home. Uh, somebody rang the doorbell. It was my ex-boyfriend. I went out to see my supposed ex-boyfriend. And it was actually this person who, blew, who threw a liter of acid on me, burned 47% of my body, including my entire face. That is how I arrived with Dr. Gaviria. That's when my rebirth process began. And I started this entire process. She was attacked with acid. Colombia is the country with the highest level of 
attacks against women with acid. This attack, everyone heard about it in the news in March, 2014. Despite suffering one of the worst attacks, she refused to be a victim. She has become a fighter for the rights of women who suffered this attack. She became known for the mask that she wears. She was a, achieved a law that uh, those who do these attacks will go to prison for up to 50 years. This is a struggle that is not just hers. The, hers, the entire country has to join this struggle. Natalia Ponce appeared today without her mask, inviting the media. It started a massive campaign saying no more masks. More than the movement grew through a campaign through the media, motivating Colombians to participate so that this, this issue came to light. People were sent a uh, mail to health professionals so that they became a part of this cause. Even the first lady of the country and governors participated in this campaign. Colombia wore the mask to stop these attacks. Oh, one moment, please. Uh, that video, sorry to those who, if, you, you can find it in YouTube, in, in English, you can find the video in English. So the 27th of March, 2014, I received this liter of sulfuric acid um, thrown at me by a man who I didn't know, who he was obsessed with me. So he planned this attack. It was all uh, a caused ahead of time. It happened at my mother's home. I didn't, I didn't live with her. I lived alone at the time. I had, I was independent. Uh, he was a schizophrenic. He, he claimed that he was schizophrenic, but the truth is he had planned the whole attack. It's been seven years since then. Since I reborn, I was reborn from the ashes, uh, my process of transformation, my evolution, the growth, spiritual growth, a complete physical change from losing my identity to having this face that I have today, which I am very proud of. And I have been able to move forward. I've had 37 surgeries, all in the Simon Bolivar Hospital. Those 37 surgeries have been by Dr. Gaviria. He is my angel. As he says, what he does, This has been uh, a work not only by him, but a, a, a professional team, a human, wonderful human experts. Uh, this is not work that any one person can do. It requires a team. I've had, I've been very blessed uh, with everything I have received and I've shared it with all the victims all the children, all the people who are burned, I share my blessings with them. Thank you to Physicians for Peace. I have skin under my grafts. It's a skin invented in London and a whole team of London doctors who, who invented a gladium skin. Thanks to, again, Physicians for Peace who connected with this doctor, who donated and sold to me part of this, this synthetic skin. 
and this doctor has come to Colombia many times with Physicians for Peace. This, uh, the transparent mask that you saw in the campaign that we did in 2015 to call attention to this uh, process of this law in Bolivia, calling for integral care and treatment for these victims, like the type of care that Dr. Vidi Gaviria provides. We were the number one country with the highest level of acid attacks per capita, um, comparable with countries such as India and Pakistan. And thanks to Physicians for Peace, they contacted Biomed Science, which is a company that builds the materials to create that transparent mask that was part of my rehabilitation. I was one of the first people in Colombia to use this mask. Very grateful to Physicians for Peace, very grateful to Biomed Science with the doctors, the, the Simon Bolivar Hospital. They gave me my life back. It has been a, a national and international effort with uh, there are many international doctors who've been supportive, uh, but it all has been, it all has happened here in the Simon Bolivar Public Hospital in Bogota, in the largest burn care facility in Colombia, and I believe in, in Latin America. It's my second home now, seven years ago, before all this transformation, what was metamorphosis, uh, it has required great mental strength love from my family, self-love, uh, confronting adversity, feeling pain as a way to grow, as to evolve. We as human beings, we're gonna suffer some stronger, some less severe. I, it was my um, burden to suffer this very severe physical and spiritual pain. Uh, but I faced it with my family. But in these seven years have taught me that mental power, positive thinking is it's key to be able to move ahead. I had two options in life. I could have spent the rest of my life crying in bed hating and suffering for the rest of my life. Or I could have uh, decided to go the difficult path to struggle constantly these seven years. I've had to establish different goals, but I, it was very clear to me that I wanted to move on. And the doctors told me we could do this step by step thousands of hours of occupational physical therapy. I used that mask two and a half years. It's very uncomfortable to use, but uh, persevering and being constant, I was able to achieve this. You have to set goals. My goals at the beginning were very small. I wanted to be able to blink. I lost my eyelids. It, it took months telling myself, blink, blink. It, it, it was a, it required mental power, but our, our bodies have memories, but I had to remind myself, teach myself to blink. My dream was to be able to eat a hamburger. Oh, I was almost a year and a half. I had to eat through a straw. I didn't have a working mouth. I couldn't eat a hamburger. Now I can, I can eat a hamburger. I think humans, you have to establish goals. You have to dream big. You have to make your dreams reality. You can't, you have to let go of the negative. I was very anger, angry. Of course I, I was, I felt rage. I, I wanted uh, revenge. But I had to go through this transformation process. I had to understand. I had to. I had to change my negative thoughts for positive ones to move forward. 
its power to be positive and to, to attract positive things. It, it was important for, for my recovery to understand that pain is part of the process. You have to set the pain aside, assimilate it, understand it, but not stay with it, not be a victim. So it requires a lot of self-love that I learned in my home, my family's love. I also received a lot of love from the world. It, it does miracles. I'm working uh, one moment, please. Bueno, entonces esa palabra, toda esta transformación. So all of this transformation and summarizing it, the word that we hear so much is to be resilient, that we're resilient. Victims, we are resilient. You can learn from it, but it, it, it's an internal work of each person. No one else can do it for you. You have to confront, you have to embrace adversity. I couldn't just be a victim. I had to be victorious. And this has opened a lot of doors for me. I started to dream big. I've been blessed. I've been able to recover. It hasn't been quick, but it's been very successful thanks to Constance and love from everyone. I didn't just stay a victim. I was able to turn the page to be victorious. From the beginning, I didn't want to be just a victim. I didn't choose for this to happen, but it happened. And so now I've become an activist, a fighter, to fight for other victims. And it's part of healing the suffering in my country. Colombia is a country with a very high, as we said, index in these, uh, these types of attacks. I use this phrase a lot. Uh, I, I don't know this person who attacked me. He is uh, in, uh, in prison for 20 years. He achieved what he, he did not achieve what he wanted to destroy me. I do have a lot of scars. Uh, he did burn my body, but he did not burn my soul. My soul is a lot stronger. I learned to raise my wings, to fly very high. And I'm a, I'm a woman who is happy and beautiful. And I have taken on this very beautiful work uh, with doctors, with patients. It's very, the, what I have received from Dr. Gavidia and others that have all been part of my recovery. I'm only grateful. It shows the world the, how important it is, the teamwork. My, my soul is intact. I fly high. I'm free. I understood that I had to forgive myself. I had a lot of rage. I wanted revenge. These are... are normal feelings, but if I didn't turn the page and forgive myself and, and let my heart forgive, and 
I would have been a victim. I gave myself the opportunity to be happy, to heal my heart, to leave that rage and negative feelings aside. I had to leave that aside. Otherwise, I was going to be in a worse prison than my attacker. I had to heal my heart. My heart, my soul was freed. I learned to fly. It's been many years. Men, a lot of support. It's been a whole process. It wasn't one day to the next that I was able to forgive. But being able to forgive gives you freedom. Hate is poisoning yourself. You're killing yourself. If I didn't leave aside all of that rage, I would have never recovered. I would have never been victorious. So this process of freeing myself is what has made me the person I am today. In 2015, I had the dream when I entered the Simon Bolivar Hospital to establish a foundation for women who were burned of any type of burns. The Simon Bolivar Hospital, it's a public hospital. And I saw the suffering of many, many women. Many, many of these women didn't have money to pay for their treatment, all the surgeries. And I decided if I get out of this alive from this situation, and if I have the strength, I want to create a foundation, a, a type of NGO. And this is what we have done in these years. We defend, we promote, we protect the human rights of persons who have been the victims of chemical attacks. Also, we work to prevent gender assaults. This is one of the common types of uh, gender attacks that exist throughout the world. After I saw the suffering of the women and after I was blessed for all that I received, uh, I want my story to be an example. Um, and this is also to help men who have been, uh, men who have been attacked, but in, in, in Colombia, this is a, an attack against women because of their gender. And we want to protect their rights. I'm not the only victim. There are thousands of us victims in Colombia. Often women, there are many Colombian women who have lived violence their whole lives. And so this is why we decided to establish this foundation. One of our big achievements was that the government in 2016 approved this law. It is known as the Natalia Ponce law. I'm very proud to have a law in my country that's named after me. It was a, it was a big effort together with many public institutions medical institutions, state institutions. Uh, but I will be sincere. It, the, the impotence to stop these attacks, uh, they've continued, these, suffer, these, patient, these victims have continued to suffer. What is happening with the law? Before this year, the acid attacks were were characterized as a, as a personal attack. And it what the, the punishment was maybe 10 or 12 years. And given that the victims will carry the effects of this attack for the rest of their lives, this law in 2016 converted this law 
to a different category of crime and increasing the penalty to 30 to 50 years in prison and created a whole set of legislative norms uh, to punish the attackers. And this has become a model law for other countries about how to prosecute uh, those who attack women in this way. We still have a long ways to go. And sometimes I just want to throw in the towel because these attacks still happen. It's, it's, it's terrible to see when the laws are not fully implemented. It was terrible to see the suffering of thousands of victims whose human rights were not respected. Now, we are struggling to make sure that all the victims get all the treatment they need, the masks and all the surgeries and everything they need. So receiving all the treatment is, an, uh, the physical treatment and the psychological treatment is an important part of the recovery. It's not only my struggle, I'm not going to throw in the towel until we see all women assisted. We need, in, in my country and in many countries, we need to see laws to protect the human rights of women. They are human rights. Uh, this is a struggle for uh, gender equality. So it's very important to invite men also to join this fight to defend women of all the types of attacks against women. Violence against women brings more misery, more suffering. This is uh, men and women have to work together to defend women's rights a national and international struggle to achieve gender equality. The, our foundation in these past six years, we have been providing a full type of accompaniment for the victims of these crimes, making sure that the state doesn't violate their rights. We would like you to know about this process of what we've been doing these six years. But we've done a lot. Um, given how small our foundation is, we've developed and implemented training programs. Everything from firemen to police to, to uh, lawyers to EMTs, we've been providing training whenever we can provide training to different groups, we do. Also, we've done a lot of work on institutional strengthening to make sure that we can provide the services to all the cases of the patients. We don't have enough resources to help all of the patients. We have a very small team and we need to keep uh, strengthening our institution. We've also been creating awareness campaigns. We have carried out several awareness building campaigns. One that you saw was the, the mask, take off your mask campaign. That campaign won Khan Awards, uh, film awards. It, it really awakened indignation uh, it really woke up the whole society of Colombia about this issue of acid attacks. So these camps, campaigns are very important to build awareness. The most important thing is to prevent these gender, this gender violence. And one of my big dreams, I'm still working on it. It's not as crazy as it sounds. I want to establish the first integral center of burn rehabilitation in Colombia. We have several different burn units, but we would like to create one 
and this does not yet exist, one integrated center for uh, the full scheme of burn rehabilitation. So that anyone who is a victim of a burn uh, can get care in one center. Right now, those who need the, the paperwork and the protocols and the bureaucratic steps to get to get all different types of care is very complicated. So we want one center. It's very difficult to get all the authorizations, the medical referrals. You have to go from one place to another, one place to get psychological care, another place to get uh, a different type of rehabilitation. So we wanna have one center to provide all this range of care. And this is one of my dreams. And I would love to have uh, Physicians for Peace and Biomed Science, uh, others to contribute, uh, provide training, all of those who have expertise in rehabilitation and treatment. And our, our medium term projects, uh, we have uh, merchandise, we have uh, We have a, a book that chronicles my story that traces the whole history of from when I was attacked in all of my care. Uh, we have t-shirts and other merchandise that we sell. So we've been participating, we've been selling products online and also in different fairs. We haven't been merchant, uh, marketing internationally yet. That's very difficult. We've also had our first uh, a gala event uh, in the late 2019. We had a very large gala event. We had another one planned for 2020. We couldn't do it because of the pandemic. It's, it's still on standby. We hope to have that event. Uh, this fundraising gala. And that would be to raise money for the work of the foundation. We also have many uh, sponsorships, people who support us. We ask everyone to ally with us, to support us. And here you can see how to reach me. The information is available there in English and in Spanish. And you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at these addresses. We don't yet have a way to get donations internationally. We don't yet have an international bank account. We haven't been able to set that up yet. So it has been seven years. I, I had to empower myself. You have to create your own power to share this message of resilience, of strength, and be a model for many other women. Um, tell them, don't be afraid, don't be embarrassed, speak your voice, don't, don't be quiet. If I would have, if I would have been quiet, my my story would have been lost, like thousands of stories of women in Colombia who have been attacked and who have lost their voices. I've had to become an activist. I've been blessed to receive many recognitions, many awards um, from many, uh, was named as a, as a leader in Colombia. And my story was named one of the three most inspiring stories uh, from London, the BBC and Women of Courage Award uh, that was uh, given to me by the First Lady, uh, Melania Trump, in 2016. And with all of this empowerment, it has helped me to be reborn. I have grown mentally, spiritually. I have transformed all of that hate into love. I am sharing love with the world today. It's possible. Like the phoenix rose from the ashes, we can do that as well. 
thank you for listening to me. This is my life today. This is who I am. hace todos los días, muchas gracias Natalia, mil gracias ha sido thank you Natalia this has been very such great impact to, to hear about your story everything you have been through to rise from the ashes and all the work you are doing to help other acid attack victims Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you, Dr. Gaviria. I don't know if we have time for questions. I, I know that there, we're a little over time, but those who can stay, if, if, if you need to go. Thank you for being with us, everyone. But uh, we're here, if we can, uh, I would love to, I would love to share some questions, if you could. A beautiful thing that you've done, Natalia. Those of us who work in me medicine, this is one of the most difficult situations to see. Uh, but to see what you and your team, Dr. Gaviria, have done, we also see the best of humanity. In this session, an intimate view. There are, are representatives of many different organizations who are trying to take care, uh, who are trying to take safe surgery, multidisciplinary treatments, etc. to to different people. I think we would like to know from you, from you, Dr. Gaviria, how can we be activists? How can we lobby for our rights and achieve changes that go beyond what we can achieve just in medicine? I, I, I was listening and here with my five-year-old daughter, and for me to think, to, to imagine something like this happening to a girl, 
What would you tell us to this group that is that is working to increase access to surgery to many, many people in the world? What would you tell us how to be activists, how to lobby? For me, the message is always, I grew up in a family with a lot of love. They taught me from when I was a little girl, the values that are needed in respect, tolerance, equality, sharing, loving yourself. It's it, These are all indispensable, indisp necessary values that we need to share with the rest of the world, with children. Many, those values are the first point, that there need to be homes without violence, Parents need to listen to their children, love their children, have peace. I, I was given that, that love from my parents to always move forward. I didn't live violence in my home and having grown in, if you grow in an environment of violence, you may end up being violent. I didn't have that experience. And I, I grew up, and now I, I carry on campaigns. I want to work for gender equality. I want to break stereotypes, models that we get from society, that men are the macho, that they're the ones who are in charge. But we women, we, we women are not born just to become mothers, just to care for others. We also can be empowered. So it starts at that, at that home education to break with cycles of violence. Women should not feel shame or embarrassment. And when they need help, they should find help. They should denounce abuse not stay in silence. I think the same. I think what we can all do from where we work, from our families, from wherever we are, we need to multiply. We need to be aware, build awareness of those around us. People don't, people don't want to get involved. They're apathetic. They don't want to get involved in, in problems. We need to be multipliers of building awareness, creating consciousness. We need to end violence, violence against women. It shouldn't happen. And this is something that starts from the education from children, from families. These are values, these are principles that we need to begin our lives with. We've had problems in Colombia to that laws be enforced, but we have learned to not stay silent. If there's a law that's not being implemented, enforced, uh, Natalia has has insisted that this this issue of acid attacks was not well enough known. Uh, the the issue of the treatment of the victims was not known, and she raised her voice. We believe that the strong laws did. Uh, reduce a little bit some of these crimes, the crime level. 
puede, podemos we have, been, we have had to be activists against violence and we have gained some ground. Muchas gracias, Juan Luis. Gracias, doctora Iria. No sé si hay alguna otra pregunta, ya es un poquito tarde, pero... Are there any other questions? You can put your question in the... You can... Uh, so I want to say thank you, uh, Natalia, Dr. Gaviria, for your time, for sharing with us, for being with us, for leading this presentation today. Thank you to Physicians for Peace. Thank you to, to Mark. Without all of you, Dr. Gaviria, without all of you, this miracle would not have been possible. Gracias, eh, Viviana. Pero ya todos se dieron cuenta de la calidad de persona as, que... As you all know, uh, the, the Natalia is a, a quality person. It's been a, a privilege to be her doctor. I've become, I've made a great friend in her. We've been able to together discuss what can we achieve together. I think it's what makes this, this patient doctor relationship has gone beyond the normal relationship and that has contributed to our success. She trusts in me, I trust her and that has made it a very special, powerful relationship. Uh, Gabriela, if you want to ask your question, imagino que estos algunos de estos procedimientos son muy a largo plazo, ¿no? Son varias etapas. So the ideal is when a patient comes who's been attacked, the washing off of the acid needs to be immediate. This acid can go in five minutes. It can go through all the layers of skin, and it can continue. If it continues to burn without being washed off, it can reach the muscle and the bone. On the medical level, we try to operate before 36 hours. The quickest you can operate, the, the, the better results, the better rehabilitation. The results are better the sooner you can operate. No me queda más que darle las gracias de parte de todo este grupo que ha, ha, ha sido. Thank you to everyone, all of this group who are, all of you who are here participating, all of you who are working with great faith in humanity, who keep working despite all of the things that we have still not achieved. There is hope. We are very moved and very grateful. Thank you for your time, for your message. We are in, we have been enriched by this opportunity to be, we are allies now. And with you and with all the, the humans who need us. Thank you very much. We hope to see you again. I hope this is not the last time that we are together. Thank you to all the working group, uh, all of our listeners here today. So we've gone on to an hour and a half. Thank you for ha hanging in there with us. We hope to see you again very soon. Any other comments? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Good night, everyone. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for letting us share with you our experience. Good night, everybody. Bienvenidos a Colombia todos. Andale. Gracias.